Hello, lovely people. Let's just make the afro, uh, you know, a little bit even, right? A little something. Okay. We are back with I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And, okay, hold on. Let's, let's make it even here. Okay. And this is going to be part 12. We ended yesterday um, when Joe Lewis had just won a fight and the whole community was was listening to it. And um, just sort of yesterday in general really spoke to how the black community really found their their joy and their love with one another in community, which had to do with church and had to do with like cheering on the black people who have sort of made it in the limelight, right? And she spoke a little bit about if Joe Lewis lost, then, you know, in a way, the black community lost all the things that it had gained so far. Okay. And um, so here we go. Acabaca soda cracker, acabaca boo. Acabaca soda cracker, I'm in love with you. The sounds of tag beat through the trees while the top branches waved and con I'm not sure I've ever seen this word. Contrapunal? Okay. Yep. Contrapunal? Okay. We're going to start that sentence over. The sounds of tag beat through the trees while the top branches waved and contrapuntal rhymes. I lay on a, a moment. I lay on a moment of green grass and telescoped the children's game to my vision. The girls ran about wild, now here, now there, never here, never was. They seemed to have no more direction than a splattered egg. But it was a shared, if seldom voiced knowledge that all movements fitted and worked according to a larger plan. I raised a platform from my mind's eye and marveled down on the outcome of Akka Baka. The gay picnic dresses dashed and stopped and darted like beautiful dragonflies over a dark pool. The boys, black whips in the sunlight, popped behind the trees where the girls had fled, half hidden and throbbing in the shadows. So, um, 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 Richard Wright talked about this game in Black Boy and Maya Angelou has talked about this game before called Pop the Whip where the kids all hold hands and like kind of swing each other around and whoever's at the end of the whip pops and usually gets hurt or flies through the air. So anyway, she, I feel like she's talking about this game. The summer picnic fish fry in the clearing by the pond was the biggest outdoor event of the year. Everyone was there. All churches were represented as well as the social groups, Elks, Eastern, Star, Masons, Knights of Columbus, Daughters of Pythus. Professional people, Negroes, teachers from Lafayette Counter, and all the excited children. Musicians brought cigar box guitars, harmonicas, juice harps, combs wrapped in tissue paper, and even bathtub bases. The amount and variety of foods would have found approval on the menu of a Roman Empire. Pans of fried chicken covered with dish towels sat under benches next to a mountain of potato salad crammed with hard-boiled eggs. Whole rust-eyed sticks of bologna were clothed in cheesecloth. Homemade pickles and chow chow and baked country hams aromatic with cloves and pineapples. Our steady customers had ordered cold watermelon, so Bailey and I had chugged the striped green fruit into the Coca-Cola box and filled the tubs with ice, as well as the big black wash pot that Mama used to boil her laundry. Now they too lay sweating in the happy afternoon air. The summer picnic gave ladies a chance to show off their baking hands. On the barbecue pit, chickens and spare ribs spattered in their own fat and a sauce whose recipe was guarded in the family like a scandalous affair. However, in the light of the summer picnic, every true baking artist could reveal her prize to the delight and criticism of the town. Orange spun cakes and dark brown mounds dripping Hershey's chocolate stood layer to layer with ice white coconuts and light brown caramels. Pound cakes sagged with their buttery weight 
and small children could no more resist licking the icings than their mothers could avoid slapping the sticky fingers. Proven fishermen and weekend amateurs sat on the trunks of trees at the pond. They pulled the struggling bass the, pulled the struggling bass and the silver perch from the swift water. Rotating crews of young girls scaled and cleaned the catch, and busy women in starched aprons salted and rolled the fish in cornmeal, then dropped them in the Dutch ovens, trembling with boiling fat. One corner of the clearing of the gospel group was rehearsing. Their harmony packed as tight as sardines floated over the music of the county singers, and melted into the songs of the small children's games. Boys, don't you let that ball fall on none of my cakes, do you hear? Otherwise, it'll be me on you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but nothing changed. The boys continued their hitting tennis balls with palings snatched from a fence and running holes in the ground, colliding with everyone. I had wanted to bring something to read, but Mama said... That if I didn't want to play with the other children, I could make myself useful by cleaning fish or bringing water from the nearest well or wood for the barbecue. I wandered into a retreat by accident. Signs with arrows around the barbecue pit pointed men, women, children toward fading lanes grown over since last year. Feelings aged old and very wise. Feeling ages old and very wise at ten. I couldn't allow myself to be found by small children squatting behind a tree. Neither did I have the nerve to follow the arrow pointing the way of the women. If any grown-up had caught me there, it was possible that she'd think that I was being womanish and would report it to Mama, and I knew what I could expect from her. So, when the urge, to hit, when the urge hit me to relieve myself, I headed toward another direction. Once through the wall of sycamore trees, I found myself in a clearing ten times smaller than the picnic area, and it was cool and quiet. After my business was taken care of, I found a seat between two protruding roots of a black walnut tree and leaned back in its trunk. Heaven would be like that for the deserving, I thought. Maybe California, too. Looking straight up at the uneven circle of sky, I began to see, I began to sense that I might be falling into a blue cloud far, far away. The children's voices and the thick odor of food cooking up over open fires were the hooks I grabbed just in time to save myself from slipping away. Grass squeaked and I jumped at being found. Louise Kendricks walked into my grove. I didn't know that she too was esca escaping the gay spirit. We were the same age and she and her mother lived in a neat little bungalow behind the school. Her cousins who were, who were in our age group were wealthier and fairer but I had secretly believed that Louise was the prettiest female in stamps next to Mrs. Flowers. What are you doing sitting here by yourself, Marguerite? She didn't accuse. She asked for information. I said that I was watching the sky. She asked, what you watching for? There was obviously no answer to a question like that, so I didn't make one up. Louise reminded me of Jane Eyre. Her mother lived in a reduced circumstance, but she was genteel, and though she worked as a maid, I decided that she should be called a governess. And so did Bailey, who would teach, who would teach a romantic, dreamy 10-year-old to call a spade a spade? Bailey. Mrs. Kendricks could not have been very old, but to me, all people over 18 were adults, and there could be no degree of there could be no degree <clears throat> to me all people over 18 were adults and there could be no degree given or taken they had to be catered to and pampered with politeness then they had to stay in the same category of look alike sound alike being alike louise was a lonely girl although she had plenty of playmates and a ready partner for any ring game in the schoolyard her face which was long and dark chocolate brown had a thin sheet of sadness over it, as light but as permanent as the viewing gaze of a coffin, and her eyes, which I thought were her best feature, shifted quickly, as if what they sought had just a second before it eluded her. She had come near the spotted light through the trees that fell on her face, 
and braids running in splotches. I had never noticed before, but she looked just like Bailey. Her hair was good, more straight than kinky, kinky and her features had the regularity of objects placed by a careful hand. She looked up. Well, you can't see much sky from here. Then she sat down and arms away from me, finding two exposed roots. She laid thin wrists on them as if she had been in an easy chair. Slowly, she leaned back against the tree. I closed my eyes and I thought of the necessity of finding another place and the unlikelihood of there being another place with all the qualifications that this place had. There was a little peal of a scream and before I could open my eyes, Louise had grabbed my hand. I was falling. She shook her head and her long braids. I was falling in the sky. I looked at her and I liked her for being able to fall in the sky like me and admit it. I suggested, let's try it together. But we both have to sit up straight on the count of five. One, two, three, four, five. Louise asked, want to hold hands just in case? I did. If one of us did happen to fall, the other could pull the other one out. After a few near tumbles into eternity, both of us knew that's what it was. I lost my place. Oh, there it is. After a few near tumbles into eternity, eternity, both of us knew that's what it was. We laughed at having played with death and destruction and escaped. Louise said, let's look at that old sky while we're spinning. We took each other's hands in the center of the clearing and began to turn round and round. Very slowly at first, we raised our chins and looked straight up into the seductive blue patch of sky. Faster and faster. Just a little faster than faster yet. Yes, help. We were falling. Then eternity won. After all, we couldn't stop spinning or falling until I was jerked out of her grasp by a greedy gravity and thrown to my fate below. No, above. No, was I below? I found myself safe and dizzy at the foot of the sycamore tree. Louise had ended on her knees at the other side of the grove. This was surely the time to laugh. We lost, but we hadn't lost anything. First we were giggling and crawling drunkenly toward each other, and then we were laughing out loud unapologetically. We slapped each other on the back of the shoulders and laughed some more. We had made a fool or a liar out of something, and we just didn't know what we had beat at all. In daring to challenge the unknown with me, she became my first friend. We spent tedious hours teaching ourselves the Tut language. You, Yakoyu, No, Kaknugawag, What, Wakashatut. Since all the other children spoke Pig Latin, we were superior because Tut was harder to speak and even harder to understand. At last, I began to comprehend what girls giggled about. Louise would rattle off a few sentences to me in unintelligible Tut language, and we would laugh. Naturally, I laughed too, snickered really, understanding nothing. I don't think she understood half of what she was saying herself, but after all, girls have to giggle. And after being a woman for three years, I was about to become a girl again. Y'all remember? You remember why, why she spent three years not being a girl? If you don't remember, you have to go back and listen. In school one day, a girl who I barely knew and scarcely had spoken to brought me a note. The intricate fold indicated that it was a love note. I was sure she had the wrong person, but she insisted picking but she insisted it was me. Picking the paper loose, I confessed to myself that I was frightened. So, being funny. Suppose the paper would show a hideous beast and the word you written all over it. Children did that sometimes just because they claimed I was stuck up. Fortunately, I had got permission to go to the toilet, an outside job, and in the reeking gloom, I read it. Dear friend, MJ, times are hard and friends are few. I take great pleasure in writing you. Will you be my valentine? Love, Tommy Valden. 
I pulled my mind apart. Who? Who was Tommy Valden? Hmm. Finally, a face dragged itself from my memory. He was a nice-looking brown-skinned boy who lived across the pond. As soon as I had pinned him down, I began to wonder, well, why? Why me? Was it a joke? But if Tommy was the boy I remembered, he was very sober. He was a very sober person and a good student. Well, then, it wasn't a joke. All right, what evil, dirty things did he have in mind for me? My questions fell over themselves. An army in retreat. Haste. Dig for cover. Protect your flanks. Don't let the enemy close. Don't make a gap between you. What did Valentine do anyway? What did it mean? Starting to throw the paper in the foul-smelling hole, I thought of Louise. I could show it to her. I folded the paper back in its original creases, and I went back to class. There was no time during the lunch period since I had to run to the store and wait on customers. All right, so we're talking about how much kids work, right? So during her lunch break, she ran all the way back home and worked in the store. Yes. The note was in my sock, and every time Mama looked at me, I feared that her church gaze might have turned into x-ray vision, and she could not only see the note and read its message, but would interpret it as well. I felt myself slipping down a sheer cliff of guilt, and a second time I nearly destroyed the note, but there was no opportunity. The take-up bell rang, and Bailey raced me to school, so the note was forgotten about. But serious business is serious, and it had to be attended to. After classes, I waited for Louise. She was talking to a group of girls laughing. But when I gave her our signal, two waves of the left hand, she said goodbye to them and joined me in the road. I didn't give her a chance to ask what was on my mind, which was her favorite question for me. I simply gave her the note, recognizing the fold. She stopped and smiled. We were in deep waters. She opened the letter and read it. Read it aloud twice. Well, what do you think? I said, what do I think? That's what I'm asking you. What is there to think? It looks like he wants you to be his valentine. Louise, I can read, but what does it mean? Oh, you know, his valentine, his love. There was that hateful word again, that treacherous word that yawned up at you like a volcano. Well, I won't. Most decidedly, I won't. Not ever again. Have you been his valentine before? What do you mean, never again, Marguerite? I couldn't lie to my friend, and I wasn't about to fresh an old ghost, so we know what she's talking about, right? Well... Don't answer him then, and that's the end of it. I was a little relieved that she thought it could be gotten rid of so quickly. I tore the note in half and gave her part. Walking down the hill, we minced the paper into a thousand shreds and gave it to the wind. Two days later, a monitor came into my classroom. She spoke quietly to Miss Williams, our teacher. Miss Williams said, Class, before I... I believe you remember that tomorrow is Valentine's Day. So, name for St. Valentine's the martyr who died around A.D. 270 in Rome. The day is observed by exchanging tokens of affection and cards. The eighth grade children have completed theirs, and the monitor is acting as a mailman. You will be given cardboard, ribbon, and red tissue paper during the last period today so that you may make your gifts too. Glue and scissors are here at the work table. Now stand when your name is called. She had been shuffling the colored envelopes and called names for some time before I noticed. I had been thinking of yesterday's plain invitation in the expeditious way that Louise and I just took care of it. We who were being called to retrieve Valentine's were only slightly more embarrassed than those who sat and watched as Miss Williams opened each envelope. Helen Gray... Helen Gray, a tall, dull girl from Louisville, flinched. Dear Valentine, Miss Williams began reading the badly rhymed childish words. I seethed with shame and anticipation, and yet had time to be offended at the silly poetry that I could have bettered in my sleep. Now that's cold. The teacher's opening up each letter and reading it in front of the class. 
that's wrong. Marguerite Ann Johnson. My goodness. This looks more like a letter than a valentine. Dear friend, I wrote you a letter and saw you tear it up with your friend, Miss L. I don't believe you meant to hurt my feelings, so whether you answer or not, you will always be my valentine. T.B. Class, Miss Williams smirked and continued lazily without giving us permission to sit down. Although you are only in seventh grade, I'm sure you wouldn't be so presumptuous as to sign a letter with an initial. But here is a boy in the eighth grade about to graduate, blah, blah, bluey, blah. <laughs> you may collect your valentines and these letters on your way out. It was a nice letter and Tommy had beautiful pen penmanship. I was sorry I tore up the first letter. His statement that whether I answered him or not would not influence his affection reassured me. He couldn't be after you know what if he talked like that, could he? I told Louise that the next time he came across to the store, I was going to say something extra nice to him. Unfortunately, the situation was so wonderful to me that each time I saw Tommy, I melted into a delicious giggle and was ab unable to form coherent sentences. After a while, he stopped including me in his general glances. Oh, she lost her first little love, first little boyfriend. Um, Bailey stuck branches in the ground behind the house and covered them with a worn through blanket, making a tent. It was to be his Captain Marvel hideaway. There, he initiated girls into the mysteries of sex. One by one, he took the, Im the impressed, the curious, the adventurous, into the gray shadows after explaining that they were going to play mama and papa. I was assigned the role of baby and look out. The girls were commanded to pull up their dresses and then lay. he would lay on top of them and wiggle his hips. I sometimes had to lift the flap. That was our single that an adult was approaching. And so I saw their pathetic struggles even as they talked about school and the movies. He had been playing the game for about six months before he met Joyce. She was a country girl four years older than Bailey. He wasn't quite 11 when they met, whose parents had died and she along with her brothers and sisters had been parceled out to different relatives. Joyce had come to Stamps to live with a widowed aunt who was even poorer than the poorest person in town. Joyce was quite advanced physically for her age. Her breasts were not the little hard knots of the other girls her age. They filled out the top, her tops in her, in her skimpy little dresses. She, was, she walked stiffly as if she were carrying a load of wood between her legs. I thought of her as being coarse, but Bailey said she was cute and that he wanted to play house with her. In the special way of women, Joyce knew that she had made a conquest and managed to hang around the store in the late afternoons and all day on Saturdays. She ran errands for Mama when we were busy in the store, and she sweated profusely. Often, when she came in after running down the hill, her cotton dress would cling to her thin body, and Bailey would glue his eyes on her until she dried. Mama gave her small gifts of food to take to her aunt, and on Saturdays, Uncle Willie would sometimes give her a dime for the show fare. During Passover week, we weren't allowed to go to the movies. Mama said we all must sacrifice to purify our souls, and Bailey and Joyce decided that the three of us would play house outside. As usual, I was to be the baby on the outside of the tent. He strung the tent, and Joyce crawled in first. Bailey told me to sit outside and play with my doll baby, and he went in the, fl in the flap closed. Well, you ain't gonna open your trousers? Joyce's voice was muffled. No, you just pull up your dress, Bailey said. There were some rustling sounds from the tent, and the sides pooched out as if they were trying to stand up. Bailey asked, what are you doing? Pulling off your drawers. What for? We can't do it with our drawers on. Well, why not? How are you going to get it in? Silence. My poor brother didn't know what that meant, and I knew. I lifted the flap and said, Joyce, don't you do that to my brother. She nearly screamed. 
But she kept her voice low. Marguerite, you close that door. Bailey added, yeah, close it. You're supposed to be playing with your doll, baby. I thought he would go to the hospital if he let her do that to him. I want him, Bailey, if you let her do that, you'll be sorry. But he threatened that if I didn't close the door, he wouldn't speak to me for a month. So I let the end of the blanket fall and I sat down on the grass out in front of the tent. Joyce poked her head out and said in a sugary white woman in the movie's voice, Baby, you go get some wood. Daddy and I are going to light a fire. Then I'm going to make you some cake. Then her voice changed as if she was going to hit me. Now go get. Bailey told me after that that Joyce had hairs on her thing and that she had gotten them from doing it to so many boys. She even had hair under her arms, both of them. He was very proud of her accomplishments. As their love affair progressed, his stealing from the store increased. We had always taken candy and a few nickels and, of course, some sour pickles. But Bailey now called upon to feed Joyce's ravaging hunger, took cans of sardines and greasy Polish sausage and cheese, and even the expensive cans of pink salmon that our family could seldom afford to eat. I'm going to have to stop right there. I'm wondering why Joyce, little Joyce is so hungry. We shall see. Thank you for joining me tonight. And I look forward to speaking to you tomorrow as um, we continue to read. I know why the caged bird sings. Look at my book all torn up. Well used. Well cared for. Bye.